Pause. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We are officially getting started because it is already past 10 o'clock. And so welcome to the Hillsborough County Extension Office. Uh, my name is Tia Silvesi, and I'm a, um, I have a very long job title, residential horticulture agent, master gardener coordinator. And today I have some um, very good guest speakers with me, Mark and Christian um, from Revival Gardening. And so this topic of edible landscaping is, is a huge topic. Um, we could be here for four hours, but we're gonna try to condense it to more like a one hour class. Um, does anybody mind staying late if we go a little over? No, well, if you need to leave at exactly 11 o'clock, that's the time we posted the class to, then feel free to just walk out. Um, we did give out some handouts. We'll be mailing the handout to the Zoom people. We did, we have some surveys we'd like to, to complete at the end of class. And so um, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so edible landscaping, the pictures on this first slide here, are all things that I grew with minimal um, fertilizer, minimal um, pesticides, just easy to grow things that like Florida. So we're gonna call them like Florida friendly edibles. Um, you know, edible landscaping is more for homeowners and it's not necessarily like running a commercial farm, like where you're growing acres of tomatoes and you, you know, give them 200 pounds of nitrogen and spray them with five different chemicals every week. So this is more just for homeowner backyard production. And we have this cool infographic here, you know, that just kind of explains what edible landscaping is in an infographic. And, and we have this online too. So um, we're just trying to produce vegetables, herbs, and fruits in an environmentally friendly way, uh, applying the nine Florida friendly principles, which we won't get into those, but there's a whole class on that. But, but you know, the Edible landscaping infographic kind of sums it up here where, you know, you have a house, you're growing a couple fruit trees, there's a papaya, there's an avocado pictured here, you know, you might have a tomato plant and anybody knows that grows tomatoes, you might get some tomato hornworms on there, so you have to be scouting for pests all the time. Um, pineapples, you know, they do great in a container. Um, and then you can have your little vegetable garden and your little compost pile. And it doesn't have to be ex exactly like this, but this is a, a simplified. Um, so in our classes, we like to give like the gardening for dummies and then gardening for advanced people. Um, I have a master's degree in agriculture. I've been doing plant stuff since I was a little baby. I grew up on my grandparents' um, 13 acre farm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so a lot of stuff you learn by experience and then some stuff you learn at school and um, with plants, there's kind of good and bad, but there's not necessarily a right or wrong way always. So getting into this topic of edible landscaping, you know, we're just incorporating edibles into the yard, like your backyard. It can be residential. Um, it can be even commercial properties. Sometimes the cities are planting like fruit trees, like loquats you know, on the right of way or something like that. Um, I don't know how tasty those fruits will really be growing next to the highway or if I would really want to eat them. And then this can be a mixture of fruits, vegetables, flowers, maybe native plants. Um, today we had a couple of native milkweeds we were giving away. And then people call this term all kinds of different things. You might have heard permaculture or permanent agriculture, you know, and that's just using perennials in your landscape. Um, food forest, that's a hot buzzword. Who wants to have a food forest in your backyard? It's kind of the same thing as the edible landscape. Um, Agroecology you know, growing things in an ecological way. And so, like I said, usually residential, generally not commercial, like a farm or a commercial orchard. So here's just some examples of um, edible landscapes. Like this one here, you can see it's a, just a normal house downtown. It has a papaya. 
and it has a mango, you know, they still do have a big oak tree. And so these edibles, you know, the, if you choose the right ones, they fit in really nice with all the other plants in the landscape. Um, this one here, they have a little trellis in the backyard growing a chayote squash. Chayote, look how good it's growing, you know, not too much maintenance there. You, they also have some pineapples in the pots over here. Um, this one here is a little bit more wild, but they have a banana and this is a ginger uh, turmeric. And um, right behind here is the elderberry tree. You can't really tell from this picture. So they can look a lot of different ways and it just depends what, what site you have to um, start with. So in short, the goals of edible landscaping is we wanna grow food. Mostly people wanna plant edibles in your yard because you wanna eat food. And so easy to grow edibles, you know, choosing the right plants for your site, uh, maintaining them in a Florida friendly way and kind of working towards sustainability. We're gonna talk about composting and soil building and how you can more like close the loop, recycle your organic matter from your yard instead of this import and export thing, you know, throwing away all your leaves and then buying fertilizer. Because on a small property, even a normal homeowner lot, you can um, work towards, you know, self-sufficiency and a more closed loop system by recycling all your organic waste. Now this picture here um, with the house and the broccoli plants in the front yard, um, this is possible, but you have to be an expert gardener. If you've ever grown broccoli before, it's not just put it in the ground and let it go. I mean, first of all, in order to get a broccoli head bigger than the size of a baseball, it's gonna need some fertilizer. It needs very nice rich soil and constant water. You know, it needs to be irrigated a couple times a week. So the guy who's, this is Jim Co Kovaleski's house and um, one of my friends, Pete Canaris, he owns a company called Green Dreams and they do like YouTube videos and have a plant nursery and stuff. So he does a lot of um, videotaping of, of Jim because he's such an expert grower. Another season, he took all the broccoli out and had sweet potatoes all in his front yard, 3000 pounds of sweet potatoes. So um, I'm going to have to learn from him. He probably has some good secrets I could learn. Um, so this um, presentation is kind of summarized in an EDIS publication we have for you. And um, we'll be sending out to the Zoom people called Edible Landscaping Using the Nine Florida Friendly Principles. And um, I'm the main author of this publication. This is an area that I'm really passionate about. And um, so be sure to find this and look up the information because um, it's really packed with really good stuff. So the way it all starts is the right plant in the right place. And this is the first principle of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, where you want to choose the plants to match your site. If you're here in uh, Tampa or Central Florida, Orlando, you're going to be in the USDA hardiness zone 9, 9B. You know, 9A is slightly cooler, 9B, 10A, whatever. Um, and so that's very important. You can't bring an apple tree down from Pennsylvania and plant it in Florida and expect to grow anything. Really apples like just don't really do well. It's just too warm here. So don't really waste your time. If you're a little further up north like Gainesville, then they, they can do better. So that's very important. Looking at your site conditions, not only getting the plant suitable for our climate, but your individual site. And this is gonna be different for everybody here because you are wanting to um, look at your soil type and the soil moisture, and then how much light do you have? Um, any competition from existing landscape material. Like if you have a huge oak tree in your front yard, kind of forget about growing a lot of things. Maybe pineapples will grow there or some peppermint, maybe lettuce in the shade. And your views, you know, what does it look like from outside your house? What do you want it to look like? And then what kind of hardscape do you have? Any walkways, driveways, you know, pool fence, you have to just draw a map and work it all in and say, okay, well, this is a sunny, hot location. This is more um, wet and shady, maybe bananas like wet and shady, avocados like more hot and dry. 
And so in addition to the macro, you know, part, there's the microclimate effect. So you'll get to learn this, especially when we have a little freeze or something. Um, this was all banana plants in the same freeze. And you can see the one on the top left corner. It looks perfectly green because it was under my bamboo plant. But the one in the bottom right corner was just out in the open no protection from anything over story and that froze back now bananas are you know they regrow from the root so all of these bananas are still fine today but you know the one that froze that fruit was toast after that the one that didn't freeze produced uh hand of bananas earlier in the year because it didn't have that freeze shock um, so in selecting the right variety is important too, and this is a very complicated topic. Um, we have a UF IFAS expert down in South Florida, Jonathan Crane. He co-authored this along with um, Jeff Williamson and others, and they have a table. It's called Dooryard Fruit Varieties, so it's mostly for fruit trees, but they show your varieties by zone. So for example, if you're looking at, you know, apples, it's just the first one on the list here. You know, what zone do they grow in? North and central. Um, I still don't recommend them for Tampa, but um, the Tropic Sweet, the Anna and the Dorset, these are the three best varieties. So if you go to a, a fruit tree nursery and they have 10 different varieties of apples, you look at this publication, print this out and take this with you and be like, well, do you guys have an Anna or a Dorset? Because that's what UF says is the best varieties. And we update this publication every couple of years. Um, it's impossible to keep up with all of the varieties everywhere, but um, you know, we, we try to keep it updated as good as possible. Um, so with vegetables, another thing that's important is the right plant in the right time. Time is extremely important. Where I'm from in Pennsylvania, we planted everything in the spring, like March, April, May. There's that saying knee high by the 4th of July for corn. So corn here, like we want to plant February 15th is nothing like Pennsylvania. And so you want to be selecting the right plants for the cool season in the winter or the warm season in the summer. Um, we're, we're pretty much in the a, a beyond warm season right now. It's like the hot season. So um, very few things really like to grow right now, except for black eyed peas, seminal pumpkin, Everglade tomatoes, maybe some types of eggplants. Um, and so in order to get that information, you wanna check the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide and it will show you all the different plants. It will tell you the recommended varieties and it will also say when to plant them according to what part of the state you're in. And we will share all these links um, afterwards and an email to everybody who registered. Um, and so back to edible landscaping, one of the key principles here is to choose low maintenance edibles. If you're starting to grow herbs like rosemary, that's one of the easiest plants to grow. It's, it's very hardy, it can take sun. The only thing that kills it is too much shade and too much water. So planting the right plant in the right place choosing um, low, you know, plant plants with low water needs or plants that are drought tolerant, you know, things that can kind of take care of themselves when you go on vacation for three weeks, you don't got to worry about it. Uh, maybe slow growing, maybe compact, depending on your site and focusing really on perennials. So plants that live for a couple years or long lived annuals like kale is an annual, but it might live up to six months whereas lettuce only is 30 day crop. Um, and you also wanna look for things with no major pest or disease problems. So I'm just gonna go through some low maintenance vegetables, herbs, fruit trees, um, low maintenance vegetables. There are a lot of vegetables out there. Most of them tend to be a little higher maintenance. You ever grow a cucumber? You probably got the pickle worm. Cucumbers equals pickle worms, that's just, something you know when you plant a cucumber you're going to have to deal with those pickle worms but if you plant some green beans that's my number one recommended um, beginner crop 
if if you have kids this is they have big seeds they're easy to plant and in 60 days you can get a nice bundle of green beans like that no fertilizer no pesticides um, cherry tomatoes like the yellow pear pictured here um, we have some um, everglades tomatoes we were sharing in the back um, also hot peppers collards and kale like i said they're very easy to grow they might get an occasional caterpillar um, but not very problematic um, also swiss chard as an alternative for spinach it can grow a longer season and take um, more warmer temperatures um, here's some of those Florida cultivars that I mentioned, the seminal pumpkin. And these are kind of hard to find in, in uh, seed catalogs sometimes. So that's another benefit of growing your own, um, coming to events like this, being part of a community, uh, a Facebook garden club, a community garden. And that way you can share the seeds and replant them and share them with your friends um, year after year. Um, I've been saving seminal pumpkin seeds for like the last 20 years and haven't purchased any. Um, also the Everglades tomato, you know, these are both open pollinated heirloom varieties. So if you get a tomato, you can squish out the seeds, you know, plant them, and then you'll have your own crop here. So these are heat tolerant, unlike other tomatoes, they will continue to flower and bloom and make fruit all summer long. And then they'll actually become a weed in your garden where they just start popping up everywhere and you're like, oh no, more tomatoes. <laughs> then you'll be trying to give them away to your friends and they'll be like, oh no, I got enough. Um, herbs, pretty much all herbs are low maintenance, um, maybe except for cilantro. Cilantro is kind of like lettuce. It grows for 30 days and dies. There's a more heat tolerant type called culantro. And that is um, great, long lived, doesn't quite have that nice fleshy taste, but um, still gives flavor to your food. So all types of basil are great. I just went on a farm visit and they had basil everywhere in their landscape. And it, it was just wonderful because not only is it a herb you can eat, you can make tea, it's attracting the beneficial insects. Bees love basil. Um, oregano is very easy. There's a lot of different kinds of oregano. Roselle, the one with the, um, the red calyxes here, that's, and there's other types of hibiscuses that are edible. Um, rosemary, I already mentioned. Onion and garlic chives, they're like a perennial little bunching, you know, um, lily grass thing. Uh, tarragon with the yellow flowers here. Those are just long lived, easy to maintain. Turmeric, we had some turmeric in the back today. Um, very easy to grow. It does go dormant in the winter um, from January until May. So that's just something to note, but you can dig some of those up, get a piece, give it to your friends. And then fruit trees are, are a really key point of edible landscaping because um, you know, all the vegetables and herbs, they're still kind of relatively short lived, um, you know, so you have to keep planting them. But once you get into trees and perennial shrubs, then you can really start to create that landscape look and kind of have the vertical layering with different things. So um, bananas are one of my favorite fruits to grow. I just really love bananas. They're fun to grow. Um, if you plant them in a little bit of shade in a wet spot, they don't need a ton of water if you get them in the right place. And um, they generally produce in the fall. Um, figs are another one. Fig trees, you know, we have one in the back in our goodie garden and it just produces figs and we pretty much neglect it. So the only thing about the figs is they just kind of have a one little window. Mulberries, um, this another great Florida friendly fruit tree and mulberries kind of are very consistent and bearing. They make enough berries for you to eat. The birds can have some, some can drop on the floor. So there's usually plenty to go around. And, and then, you know, they, you can let them go or you can keep them trimmed so you can reach all the fruit and um, very easy Florida friendly to grow. Um, papayas is another one. And um, these, you can plant the seeds today and have fruits in nine months. So they're technically not a tree. They're more like herbaceous, like a banana is. 
um, but very quick to fruit. Um, they can get a little pest problems, can be hit or miss. So if you have problems with that, you can contact our help desk. Um, Jabodi Kaba, the next one over, it's a, it kind of looks like a crepe myrtle tree and it gets these purple cherry looking fruits on the stem. And so this is a great one if you have one of those HOAs that doesn't allow you to have any edible fruits, then it kind of just looks like a normal tree or shrub, just plant it next to your crepe myrtle and nobody will ever know. Um, mangoes is another good one. We're coming upon mango season now. We have a mango out back and it's just making some fruit. We didn't pay too much attention to it. Um, pineapples are a great choice and they're small. They're not a tree, but you can plant them at the base of all of your trees. And they even do well in part shade. They can take full sun to part shade. The trick on the pineapples is once you get a big, fat, juicy looking pineapple, then you have to harvest it when it starts to turn a little yellow. It gets a little yellow or orange blush on it and bring it inside. It will continue to ripen inside but if you leave it outside, like the raccoons, just know like one day before you do that it's ripe. And then you'll come back and you'll be like, oh, my pineapple. Oh. Because they take 18 months to fruit. That's a year and a half. So that's why you want to plant like 30 of them in your backyard. Every time you have a barbecue, just bring pineapple as your potluck dish. And then you can plant the tops. And um, you can even put them in pots if you're going to move or you have a small space. And then, you know, every year some of them will make fruits and then you have to wait for the rest of them. Um, passion fruit is another good one. Star fruit, they get to be a beautiful tree and it, it can be very abundant too. Um, so those are some good ones. Now, a lot of these do need like that 15 foot of spacing. You know, if you have a star fruit, you can't just have a loquat right next to it. Um, so give them some space, but then plant all these other little things, the herbs, the vegetables, the, the papaya, the pigeon peas, stuff like that in between to fill the space while they grow. Um, there's also evergreen edibles. So some things like the fig, they go dormant in the winter where they lose all of their leaves. And some Floridians don't like that. You know, if you're from up north, you might be used to things going dormant. But some of the ones that are evergreen, if you want, you know, just a nice, nice looking tropical, you know, landscape, there's the avocado, um, the edible hibiscuses, like the cranberry hibiscus with the red leaves in the second picture here. Um, also olive trees in the third picture. Um, there's also commercial olive groves in Florida. If you're a homeowner and you just have one plant, you might get like five olive berries and it might not be enough to process into making olives, but they still look cool and they're very pretty tree. And then there's a lot of different types of perennial spinaches. Like this is the purple um, Okinawan spinach on the, on the right. You know, things like rosemary, um, star fruit trees, star fruit you can only grow in tropical areas. So that's just something to think about. So when you go to incorporate these edibles in your landscape, um, you might start by kind of doing a site assessment and identifying all the plants on your property. If you need help with any plant ID, you can email us at HillsMG and our help desk can help you out. Um, one thing you might wanna start with is taking out any undesirable plants. Like, you know, when you're poor and your friends are like, here's a nice plant, you can have this. It will just take over and spread everywhere. And you're like, great. But then later you're like, I don't like this plant anymore. I would rather have a mango or more pineapples or different varieties of bananas. So you might wanna think, what do I wanna take out to clear the slate? You know, we definitely wanna keep um, big oak trees. They are protected in some municipalities. Um, native plants, you know, try to keep some of those. Maybe some of those do nothing landscape plants like that podocarpus or the ligustrum that you have to keep hedging to three feet, even though it wants to be like 10 feet. You know, maybe that would be a good one to take out. But that's up to you. In this case, you get to be 
you know, the decider of the universe and say, this plant is going to die. I'm going to dig that one up. I'm going to plant this one. And so, um, you know, in the terms of landscaping, we want it to be beautiful. We want to create a edible landscape that is looking good to our neighbors year round. If you're in the country, you don't got to worry about that, but um, it doesn't have to really look good, but your neighbors will be more happy with you. A lot of these edible rules and HOAs come from like people who grow a field of corn in their front yard and then they don't pick it and then it's infested with rats. So keep your neighbors happy and just make it look good. And so some key design concepts for doing the landscaping part, the design work is, you know, do some research on each species of these trees and look to see what is the mature height you know, what is the mature spread? And you can find that in these EDIS publications I mentioned. You know, how much sunlight does it need? What kind of soil conditions does it like? The pH or the soil moisture? And then, um, you know, you're going to identify these areas in your landscape that are maybe hot and dry, sunny, or kind of shady and wet. So then you're going to be like, okay, well, papaya and avocado, they like the hot and dry. The the banana, the ginger, the turmeric, they like the little bit more cool and shady. So I'm going to plant this there and that there. And then use this layering technique, you know, that is the same concept as they talk about in the food forest, where you have, you know, mature canopy trees, or you want them to be mature. And then you might have some middle range, you know, kind of shrub things, bananas, papayas, cherry trees. And then maybe you have a vine layer, some um, passion vine or a dragon fruit vine or something growing up there. And together, it's going to just become a, a nice food forest, edible landscape, you know, a nice homestead. And that's where you really get into the sustainability, you know, that Mark's going to talk about where you're building the soil based on, you know, the plants. So um, all this um, design work is in this publication, Landscape Design with Edibles by Gail Hansen, and she's an expert up in Gainesville. And she has this really cool table of all the visually appealing plants. So if you want it to look good, like lemongrass, it's just a nice bunching grass. It looks beautiful. Nobody will even know it's edible. And then you can impress your friends, you know, when you have house parties and be like, oh, well, look at this. I can just make tea out of this. You know, there'll be so many useful plants in your landscape. Also um, talk about food security in times of hurricane, like a cassava, you know, you can grow that and it can be there, but then we get a big hurricane and the stores are closed for a week. Then you can dig up all those roots and eat them, you know, hopefully that will never happen to us, but you just never know. Um, so here's just some of the ornamentals that I thought were pretty, like the, the red leaf cassava here with a variegation of loquats. Loquats are a very nice form tree, evergreen. They get those little fruits, flowers. Um, also this star fruit tree, look how pretty that is. Nobody would even know it's a star fruit um, just growing your landscape. Um, the star fruit, you will have to pick up the fruit and compost it or something because it is a heavy bearer. And so um, next I'm going to um, pass it on to Mark and he is going to talk about uh, mulching, compost, fertilizer, beneficial insects, like things to maintain because it's one thing to go and get the, the fruit tree and plant it, but like then what? You know, it, you are going to have to observe your plants and adjust it and, and know what to look for. And so let's give him a, a big round of applause. And what's this for? Just put it in the pocket. Okay. Okay, can you all hear me well? Uh, thank you, Tia. Thank you, IFIS Orange County Extension for having me here. Um, my name is Mark. I'm with Revival Garden. I'm also a Master Gardener volunteer in Orange County. Um, we do worm castings and organic living soil. So we're all about the soil and, and doing it from an organic standpoint. And so we're going to talk about maintaining your edible landscape uh, using mulch uh, or, and then compost, uh, fertilizer, 
to beneficial insects and then irrigation. Uh, let's see how this works. Okay, so Florida soils. Uh, most of you guys know that uh, we got a lot of sand here. Uh, so, so it has a lot of good drainage, which also means a lot of your organics want to filter on through. So we're going to kind of get you to learn how to build those organics in your soil so we can hold moisture and nutrients. Uh, because of the soil, low in nutrient, low water holding capacity. And we have location exchange capacity called CEC. And that's basically just think of an electronic way to break compounds apart for single elements for the nutrients to come in and be taken up into your plants. Don't go too crazy on it, but that's what it is. Um, and we have a high risk of leaching here because of the way the soils are. So adding uh, organic matter to improve your soil. The, the compost and other types of organic material can definitely improve your soil. And the organic matter will help hold that moisture and water, and it'll increase the nutrient holding capacity. So we're gonna go through here in a minute and, and show you how to use your own landscape materials to create your own mulches and compost. You keep things in the loop, as Tia said, and you start to, you know, instead of spending money all the time, uh, you've all seen black cow now at the store, a cubic foot of what is supposed to be composted cow manure is $6.50, and it's crazy. Not a lot of nutrients in it either. Um, we want to increase our soil moisture, and we can do that with the organic matter. And also, in the organic matter, you have a lot of microorganisms. And they work with the chemistry in the soil, electricity in the soil, and the nutrients to break that down to make it bioavailable to your plants. So recycling uh, the organic materials to improve your Florida friendly landscape. This is a publication. Uh, it's worth the read. So uh, I think at the end of this presentation, you've got links to this too. And uh, it's going to be sent to the people on the webinar. Yeah, definitely read this publication. It'll give you a lot of great ideas. Uh, so just some simple things. Grass cycling. You can uh, basically take your lawnmower clippings. Okay. Um, you can leave it on the lawn and it'll save you time. It'll save you the money. And as it says here, it's equivalent to about one fertilizer application a year. So it's that much less you got to spend or that much less chemicals. That's where we try to go chemical free. Okay. But only remove the top third of the grass blade. That's very important. Um, doing it this way, you won't get a thatch buildup. It'll decompose properly. Keep your pest problems down. Again, only a third of the grass blade. Tree cycling, uh, leaf it be. Uh, leaves and pine needles, uh, you can just leave it under the tree. It'll, it'll uh, break down and turn into mulch. Uh, you can rake the leaves into landscape beds and um, you can cover this material with mulch if you like. Uh, on the farm, we have a saying, nothing leaves the farm. If it's organic, it stays there. A tree comes down, a limb comes down. We're, we're hacking back uh, weeds and grass. It all goes into a major pile. If we get cardboard boxes that come in, the labels come off, the tape comes off, that goes into, nothing leaves the farm. It's gonna save you a lot of money and it's gonna help build your soils here, okay? Um, if you're using mulch, you can use pine bark, pine straw. Uh, you got the leaves from trees if you have that, Malaluca mulch, mixed hardwoods, um, eucalyptus mulch and utility mulch. And that's, you can call chip drop and arrange for how people to bring your, your wood chips in. Um, try to stay away from cypress mulch. It may not be harvested sustainably. One thing about the mulch layer, you wanna, before you put these mulches out, if you're like say chipping a tree, you wanna make sure that those wood chips have been aged first. Don't take freshly chipped wood and start putting it around your plants. It'll change the chemistry in the soil sucking nitrogen, doing different things. Once it's been aged, that means when it turns brown, then it's perfectly fine, okay? Uh, the compost to improve soil fertility. So finished compost, it's rich, it's crumbly, it feels like soil, uh, it smells like the earth. Um, you can dispose of your food and your yard waste through the natural processes. And we're gonna get into composting and vermicomposting, but it will definitely enhance your soil health and the structure. It will contain beneficial organisms. 
You can add it to potting soils for your raised bed. You can, you can even use it as mulch in itself. It'll just, once it becomes compost, be very quickly taken up either into the soil or by the plants. But it, it can be used as mulch as well. And you can brew it to make compost teas. And that's a big thing now. People are making teas and then taking other ingredients that normally if I were to use it in a solid form and broadcast it, it could get expensive. But if I make a tea and spray the tea, it's a real economical way of getting additional nutrients and different things into your soil and for integrated pest management. So there's a lot of ways to compost. Um, you see over here, the, the big bin set up. That's over actually in Orange County. And that's set up so that as they layer in these bins, brown, green, brown, green, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. And as the first bin fills up, they go to the next bin. And because it's got a wire screen all around it, like you, is this our little pointer here? Right here, it's all screen. It gets a lot of air to it. And it's outside so it can get rain. For your compost to work, it needs moisture and it needs oxygen to it. And static piles, if you want it to go quicker, you got to turn it over. You also want your compost pile to heat up more than 130 degrees to kill weed seeds and pathogens. So if you're doing a home compost and you're throwing your food scraps in there and it takes time, you can't rush compost. It has to happen. The more moisture it has, the more you turn it, the faster it'll go, but let's go. We also have got a compost bin. Someone's got a tub, they're composting there. Um, usually you'll see those uh, with vermicomposting using composting worms. And there's some other types of uh, bins. You've seen a new one now that they've got that's like the geo bin. Was it like $30 or something? And it works really well. So it's like the cheapest compost bin ever. And you don't need a lot of space. Obviously, the, the bin that's made with wood and wire, you need some space. So there's dependent on your yard, how much space you have. There's also some people don't want to go through it. And they do what they call trench composting, which is basically digging a hole deep enough so that when you put your compost material in the soil back on top, the critters don't come and it just breaks down naturally over time. So there's a, we got a lot of publications. There's a good class on composting here. Worm composting, also called vermicomposting. That's what we do. Um, you use composting worms to recycle, recycle food scraps. If you would do that at the home, the commercial operation is a little bit different, but basically you're, you're gonna be breaking down materials that are gonna pass through the worms. So a lot of people ask for the red wigglers because that's what is best known out there. Uh, we use European red night crawlers and Indian blue worms in a combination because they each take a little different temperature. So when we have our colder season and then we have our warmer season, we're always producing castings. We're not in the business of worms, even though we sell them, we're really in the business of producing worm castings, okay? So we use the combination. They don't mix and interbreed, okay? But these are the three main ones that work really well here in Florida. Um, the worms have mouths, but no teeth. So they're basically taking in the bacterial and fungal slime, meaning when bacteria poops, that's what goes through their systems, okay? And then it, it, it adds to the, in the digestive system, you have a, a wide variety of microorganisms, enzymes and hormones. So as that material is passing through, it comes out like a little, almost looks like a coffee ground. And they're so, so rich in nutrients and so full of biology. And the reason you put those in the soil, that adds a lot of biology. It really kickstarts things. So uh, the benefits, it improves the soil structure, uh, plant nutrients, it's nature's fertilizer. Uh, protects plants from pests and diseases. There's natural bacteria in there that fend off a lot of diseases. It adds beneficial microbes and it's a slow release way of feeding plants. You, you can't burn your plants with worm castings. You go more than 20% in a soil mix, you don't get any more benefit from it. So don't over cast it, but you're not gonna burn anything. It's kid and pet friendly and it, it doesn't smell. It smells like the earth. Okay, compost versus fertilizer. Sure. So I use one of those tumbler uh, composters. Mm -hmm. You put worms in that. You can put worms in it, but what happens is when you compost, your compost is going to heat up. Okay, and you like I said, you want to get it to one thirty to kill pathogens and seeds, and then that's called the the uh, the mesothermic stage. 
than the mesophilic stage when it starts cooling down because you've killed everything. There's no life in it. When it starts cooling down, you got the biology has got to get kicked back in and you can throw a handful of dirt in there to kick it in. But it's still going to be 125, 120, 130. Your worms, you want to try to keep them below 85 degrees or it, they, they either run off and if they can't run off, you're cooking them. Okay, so what's that? Oh, the question was, can you put composting worms in your, in your composting tumbler? And the problem is it heats up. It's not a good thing. Now, I will say that if you have finished compost from that tumbler, it's an outstanding worm bedding that you can then add your food, uh, food and uh, fruit products to because you need a bedding for the worms. And they will go through that as well. Some people, you can use cocoa core. You can use you know, cardboard that's been wet and all this. There's a whole class on vermicomposting. But yeah, if you have regular compost, that's black gold. And if you add it to your worm bin as a bedding, you turn it into diamonds. Okay, so it's great material to use. Yes? Sorry, we're not lucky enough to have our own vermicomposter. And we can't get to something like yours to actually get the fresh worm casting. Can we buy a commercially bagged? Yeah, so the question is, if we're not lucky enough to be doing our own vermicomposting and we can't get to a place to buy it, can you buy it online? Yeah, you can buy it online. And, but you got to make sure you're, you're, you're getting either pure worm castings or vermicompost, which is material that the worms are going through, but they just haven't gone through everything yet. It's not pure worm castings. Vermicompost and worm castings, if they're bagged properly and have ventilation, are good for like 18 months as long as they stay moist. You get less and less biology over time because it's not being fed, but as soon as you put it in the soil, there's different ways to feed the soil that boost that right back up. Remember, beneficial bacteria and fungi will expand. But like I said, that's a whole nother class. And there are ways to do that. If you don't have vermicompost, there's ways to supercharge your regular compost using rock dust and things, but that's a, there's a whole subject on that. But as we go through this, we'll find that the more, the more things you plant around your home, whether it's edible or regular landscaping, the more different things you add to your composting, the better your compost is gonna be, the richer your soil is gonna be. And you start actually building up your soil through your own landscaping. So the question is, she's got, you got a compost bin, a, a small tumbler, and you're on a, you got a patio garden, that's the space you got. And is there a vermicomposting system for something that small? There are. They're usually the ones that you have to put indoors because of the temperatures, but yeah, they make small towers. There's all different kinds of things you can use. They make a bags that hang in a little square frame. Uh, so there is systems that you can use small scale. Shade is good. Yeah, so it, would I be able to keep it outside? It depends on, 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 on how big your bin is. You need, you need mass of bedding to insulate the worms. The inside of the worm bin's gotta be 85 degrees or less to keep the worms happy. Okay. The inside, so we can be like, it's 110 out in the middle of summer here. Ours are outside, but the way we use, the way we build the big beds and the way we cool them naturally we keep them at about 78. So they're producing castings and they're just happy worms. Okay, so it all, it all depends. And there's, you really got to go through the vermicomposting class to get all the little different things because you're going to dial in your vermicomposting system based on your microclimate, your yard, your home. Okay, and, and then what you, how much space you have. But there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. Okay. Okay, um, okay so <clears throat> compost. Uh, has less than 1% uh, nitrogen. It's not considered a fertilizer, okay? And so generally good to add to plants at all the times because it's, it's not gonna throw any chemical balances off and uh, it builds the soil health and it's usually pretty close to pH neutral. So you can add compost all through your plant's growing cycle. Fertilizer, uh, it has a guaranteed analysis on it. 
And so if you look here, you'll see where it's got the nitrogen is the 16, that's your first number. Your second number is your phosphorus and your third number is your potassium, okay? It may or may not contain organic matter, okay? Fertilizer adds nutrients and the nutrient source and rate are specific. It's, out, it's listed on the bag. And the subject, uh, the fertilizer is subject to rules and regulations and ordinances. So a lot of counties have a fertilizer ban in the summer during the rainy season because people tend to put too much down and it runs off into our waterways, okay? There's a way to take your compost, like I said, to supercharge it. So you can get both the benefits of the organic matter and get some nutrients. And again, you, you really need to take that class, but it'll, it'll change your world and it'll save you a ton of money. Uh, the contents of fertilizer. So it's usually nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, nitrogen is needed in large quantities by plants. And fertile, uh, the phosphorus is for the roots and the flowers. It's already abundant in our soil. Potassium is like the multivitamin. It helps plants all the way around. And the nitrogen and pea contribute to the water pollution and are often banned in the summer. Going back to the fertilizer bans because people need a lot of nitrogen, keep things green, but that sometimes is too much and it runs off, okay? The phosphorus is already here in our soil um, and we don't want the phosphorus because that causes the algae blooms and other things to happen. Uh, so read the, read, the, read the front of the bag. And then as Tia said, there's a lot of publications on all these plants. And at the bottom of the publications are all the fertilizer recommendations. So it tells you, do I want a 14, 14, 14 or a 14, 0, 6? Okay. Fertilizer can be organic or inorganic. Okay. We're the organic guys. It's we just, we're trying to get our systems back to the way it used to be because we don't want the chemicals in our food. All right. So a vegetable fertilizer contains NPK. Extra N for the leaves, now that's the nitrogen, and more PK for fruiting. And if you'll see, fruit trees have a different requirement than vegetables. And the micronutrients are important. Some fertilizers carry the micronutrients, some don't. In um, the best management practices, you cover to reduce your nitrogen loss. That's where the, the uh, composting or the, if you're adding compost to the top layer or if you're mulching, so you wanna, you wanna keep your nitrogen losses down and you wanna keep more moisture in the soil. So water conservation. So that's the, that's the best management practice. Do not apply your fertilizers, organic or inorganic before a heavy rain. They're just gonna wash away and, it's, and you're gonna be just losing your money and you're gonna get things into the system. We're trying to bring the systems back to nature and pristine and clean up our waterways. Always follow the label instructions. The way the fertilizer rules are, there are specific instructions. They're posted on the bag. If you follow them, it works. I've had people go, well, I've got this going on in my lawn like a weed. And so if I use twice as much, I'll get rid of the weeds faster. And all they did was kill the whole lawn. And you'll do the same thing. You'll burn your plants with too much fertilizer, depending on the plant site, what it is and where it is in the plant life. So please follow the directions on your fertilizer. Very, very important. So fertilize after you transplant and at when flowers and fruit appear. Now this isn't compost. Compost you can put down anytime, right? But fertilizer that has the nutrients. So if you've got a transplant like you all have on your tables, when you transplant, you can fertilize. If you're putting seeds in, we don't recommend you do the seeds until they come up, all right? And then when you see flowers and fruit, that's when your plant really needs some nutrients. So that's when you'd fertilize next. And again, Every plant, you can look it up on the IFAS publications, it will give you the fertilizer recommendation when to do it and how much to do it. Fruit tree fertilization. So fertilize on a regular schedule two or three times per year. Use a high potassium fertilizer to produce fruit, such as an eight, three, nine. Uh, too much nitrogen will promote leaf growth. Um, and you fertilize to the drip line. So the drip line is, I'm a tree or my fingertips is where the end of the branches are, and I, this is all leaves. The drip line is from where my fingertips go, the end of the, at the end of the branches. That's the drip line on your tree, okay? So at least once a year, do a full year micronutrient spray. That's gonna be on the leaves, under the leaves, and on top. Under the leaves is where it pulls in the nutrients, most of them. And it says spray with boron, copper, zinc, and manganese. Again, 
You can look up every fruit tree, just type it into the IFAS, ask IFAS, I-F-A-S, and you can type in uh, avocado and all the publications on avocado will be there, including avocados in the home landscape. You click on that and it's the varieties you use, when, where to plant. And at the bottom is the feeding and fertilizing schedule. You can't screw it up. Uh, but every one of these fruit trees is on IFAS. All the information is there for you. Ask ASK and then IFAS, capital I, capital F, capital A, capital S. That is the source where, where everything goes. Okay, beneficial insects include pollinators and predators, okay? So you got bees, butterflies, ladybugs, hoverflies, lacewings, parasitic wasps, praying mantis, minute pirate bugs, Saworski mites. Uh, we like beneficial insects. It's a great way to control pests and some of the pests bring diseases. And this is a natural, cheap way uh, to not buy fertilizers and to not lose fruit and crops and leaves. Uh, big on the beneficial insects as far as our integrated pest management or natural pesticides or natural pest control. So what do they eat? Uh, aphids, caterpillars, mealybugs, mites, scale, thrip, all the stuff you're seeing coming after your fruits and vegetables. That's what they can help you with. If you look in the forest, you see a couple holes here and there, but the forest is in balance because there's the right amount of beneficial bugs, not only to pollinate, but to go after the bad bugs, the protein. And so if you, if you grow a lot of, if you have a lot of flowers and flowering things around your yard year round, providing nectar and habitat, you got a place for these good bugs to lay their eggs and hang out until the bad bugs come in and then they go get it. And so it's a matter of keeping things in balance. You're never going to get rid of everything. And if you do get rid of all the bad bugs, what are the good bugs going to eat? So it's about balance. So creating an, uh, an ecological landscape, plant a variety of flowering plants. And your fruit trees and your vegetables that you plant in your edible, remember they flower in fruit too, so that, that's considered. You plant these things in groupings because bugs identify by color and geometric shapes. Uh, include native plants because they don't need any, any fertilizer, any work. They grow in what we got right here. Plant in the sun, part sun. Make sure there's a water source, okay? Um, re it, reduce your pesticides. So anytime something's flowering, you don't want to spray it on the flowering plant because you're going to get rid of the beneficials when they're in there getting the nectar. Okay, but you can spray around the base. Uh, allow predators to eat pests to create an ecological landscape. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to use the natural things out there like our grandparents did. Uh, easy to grow flowers. So you've got a list here. Uh, Black-eyed Susan, blanket flowers, uh, calendula, coreopsis, cosmos, marigold, pentas. They grow like crazy. Phlox, sunflower, zinnia. And most of these will grow in our native soil without a lot of work. Just basically plant them, make sure they're watered well to get them established and let them go. <coughs> Use the least toxic pest controls first, okay? So sometimes sprays are needed and you want to use the least toxic first. So organic and natural products like BT, insecticidal soaps, neem oil. A lot of you are familiar with neem oil. Neem oil is not an insecticide. It interrupts the feeding and breeding cycles of insects. So you've got four cycles to an insect. So when you use neem oil, people go, I use neem, it didn't work. Well, you used it once. You need to use it four times, like every three days, four times in a row to get all the cycles to kill the insect cycle. But these are not um, chemicals, okay? And they're not, the, the neem oil is not an insecticide. Side means kill, okay? And there's an EDIS publication, which you'll see at the end of this, uh, it's Natural Products for Managing Landscape and Garden Pest in Florida. And it is worth the read, okay? It's got so many different things. And I think even now there's some more new stuff with biopesticides and things of this sort on the market that are available to homeowners that just really do a crackerjack job on keeping things up to snuff. And, and if you're actually proactive before you have the pest, you end up not getting the pests. So water and irrigation, I'm gonna turn it back to Tia because she's an expert on this. All right, well, let's get
Yeah. We'll save the uh, questions for the end, okay? Because we're almost at 11 o'clock. Can I borrow this real quick? Um, I'd also like to thank Mark and Christian for donating us these um, seed packs here. Um, edible flowers for your edible landscape. So give them another big round of applause for that. And we are sending some to the Zoom people. Um, if anybody didn't get a survey, you're going to be required to hand, um, fill out the survey before you leave. So just raise your hand and we can pass them out. All right. Let us know we're doing a good job. I still have this. Somebody left this in the bathroom, maybe. Um, and um, we just have a couple slides here to wrap up. So the next part is watering your edible landscape because um, we do get 50 something inches of rain every year, but the bad part is we get it mostly in the summer, like June, July, August, September, we get seven, eight inches, January, February, March, we get like one inch. So how many inches of water do plants need every year? I mean, every week, like on a weekly basis, plants need about one. What's well, up on the slide? one inch of water per week. All right, so that would be four inches of water per month. So in the winter, in our dry season, when we only get one inch a month, we might have to supplemental water, especially our new plants. Like you can see in the slide here, baby seedlings, they might need to be watered, you know, two or three times a day. Once you have a big established mulberry tree, you know, it can survive off of that in one inch of water a month. So it depends on the growth stages. And so we need to irrigate supplemental to our, ear, uh, to our rainfall. And so that's why we have incentive programs where you can get the rain gauge. And then you can see when it rains, you look at your rain gauge and you say, oh, look, we got an inch of water. I'm good for the week. Or maybe we got a baby shower and it barely registers. Well, that's not doesn't count for anything. I'm, I'm going to have to keep an eye on my plants to water. And so when you look at adding irrigation, there is no silver bullet. There is no such thing as a perfect irrigation system. They all break. They all leak. They're all expensive. They all need to be replaced every five years. Um, so really um, kind of hand watering can be the best if you have the time and can observe your plants like that. Um, a lot of people kind of do a combination of a lot of different methods. Like if I had a blank slate and I was going to, you know, kind of start all over, I would maybe have one irrigation system for my turf grass. And then I would have one for my landscape beds and shrubs. And then I would have like a little micro irrigation system for my container plots and maybe a drip irrigation for my row of vegetables. Um, so you can mix and match, you know, but that takes a little experience. So um, here's some different types. Um, like I said, hand watering is the most efficient because you're observing your plants. Watch them in the morning and in the evening. And if they're all sad and wilty, like they're dehydrated, then water them. They should perk up within a half an hour, an hour. You'll visually see them rehydrate. If they're all wilty in the middle of the day, well, like you go stand out in the sun at noon and see, you know, that's normal. They can't um, get enough water for their transpiration, you know, at noontime. So don't look at them at noon. You know, if you check them in the morning at, and at night and they're nice and perky, then that's good. So um, micro irrigation out of all the irrigation systems is the most efficient. So if you have row crops, um, then you can use this drip irrigation. It doesn't have to be straight. Like I have somebody who's irrigating their citrus tree and they just wrap it around the tree, hopefully not too tight. 
Um, but you know, like the drip line around the drip line where the feeder roots are. And then there's the micro sprays. These are the little guys on the sticks here. Here at Hillsborough County, we have a micro spray class where you get a whole micro irrigation kit. Um, we also have the composting class here. And then the bubblers, I like the bubblers because see how they put out that nice little stream of water? They're less likely to get clogged than this drip and the micro spray, especially if you're on well water or something, you know, the bubbler, and you can adjust them by twisting the top for more or less. They even have tree bubblers. You can put one or two around your trees and that works really good. Um, and then for the larger areas, you know, you have spray heads. So the rotary spray heads, like the Hunter MP Rotors is one brand name. Um, they are the new, more efficient irrigation and they just have little streams that rotate continuously and it kind of stimulates rainfall, like a slow, a slow rainfall where that water can percolate into the ground. So we're trying to irrigate the root zone not like way, way below the root zone where we're causing leaching of nitrogen and stuff. Um, the one on the right, this is a traditional spray head. So those put out the largest volume of water. And I would only really recommend those for a turf or if you're just, your whole entire yard is planted with everything. Because a lot of pest and disease problems come from overwatering. You know, as you wanna water in the morning, um, the fertile, I mean, the watering restrictions might even state you must water, you know, before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. because we want the water to go in the ground and not poof up in the air. And remember the compost and mulch, they're gonna help to save the water and keep the soil moist. And so I'm gonna just wrap it up here with a couple resources for you all. And um, don't forget to fill out our survey here. You're gonna be required to submit this before leaving the door by the police right there. And um, so these are some of the EDIS publications we mentioned, the edible landscaping, the fruit varieties, the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. And so I'll be sending a link with the recording of the webinar today and um, all these links that we mentioned in the talk. So um, that wraps it up. And if you guys can complete the survey, um, we have some extra free plants in the back. Everything back there is free, take it home. Um, they're all for you guys. And thank you so much. And we'll be around to take questions. Okay, question. What kind of? Millipedes. Oh, millipedes. You have millipedes in your compost bin. Those are decomposers and they're good for breaking down soil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, cool. That's your house? Oh, you see the street. So, so your landscape goes from the house. But where does the street like right here? So hey. I know in an area that has a lot of uh, drainage that comes off the street, and there's a lot of ditch that goes for acres on one side. Okay, my house is about. 50, no, there's more than that, about 150 feet away from there. On this side, I have been planting just vegetables. Yeah. But then I noticed that because I have so many oak trees also on the front of my property, back of my property, right. I use that for the cows. Anything I grow, there's always roots coming up. Even when I do it too. Yeah, I have that problem in my yard too. Too many trees, you know? So, so I'm wondering, what, should I just put, grow everything in containers? Because I'm going to grow some trees. I mean, some fruit trees to eat. So I think um, 